Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome to a new episode of IC Interviews, the podcast in which we at the Investors Chronicle discuss the biggest market ideas and stories with some of the most interesting people in the business. I'm Alex Newman, an associate editor at the magazine, and today we're going to be talking about dividends, what they mean, their peculiar absence in the US market in particular, and the possibility for a comeback there. Now, I should say that dividends haven't disappeared from corporate America. In fact, most firms in the S&P 500 do pay one. But there are a couple of big caveats. First, many of the largest, growthiest stocks have shirked payouts, as can be seen in the Nasdaq's median dividend, which is zero. And second, corporate America's preferred method of capital returns, and I'm using scare quotes there, is now the the share buyback. Dividends, it would appear, are often an afterthought in the most exciting and successful equity market in history. This and much more is the topic of a fascinating new book called The Ownership Dividend by Daniel Paris, a dividend-focused fund manager at Federated Hermes in the US, who joins me in the studio in London today. Dan, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Alex, thank you for having me and thank you for taking an interest in the book. Thank you. So this is your, it's actually your third book on dividends. Well, call it fourth, actually. That's okay. Close enough. Okay. But, I mean, you began your career as uh, as an historian and you've just looking back at some of your your previous works you've previously written that in a profession utterly lacking in historical sensibility investors periodically need to ask why we do things the way we do how we got here and whether perhaps there is a better way so on the subject of u.s stock dividends i'd like to put the first two of those questions to you so why are they unloved and how did we get here yeah, it's a, a good way to phrase it because I, I really do view myself as a historian. And when I ended up in, in finance, I was struck by how everyone is simply in the here and now. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just uh, in that environment, I ask, okay, well, why are we following the practices that we do? Uh, where do they come from? And are they still relevant? Uh, you know, you have causes and reasons why things develop and then fall out of favor. And it, it struck me as unusual that uh, businesses in the U.S. stocks, publicly traded stocks, large successful businesses, uh, didn't make uh, cash payouts to, to shareholders. And I thought that's accepted. It's the norm. It's not illegal, not immoral, unethical. But a quick check of history. Uh, found that it was uh, historically anomalous, and it's kind of intellectually anomalous from a business ownership perspective. A uh, minority business owners, meaning not majority owners of a business, would you would expect normally a, a share of the profits after operating needs and investment needs are met. Otherwise, why would you own something other than pure speculation, et cetera? But the U.S. stock market had evolved in this in this direction in which it was quite acceptable for large successful businesses to not make uh, uh, share any of the profits with the company owners. And I, I thought that was unusual. And that led to investigating the reasons why this, what I call historical anomaly occurred. And, and that is is the uh, the topic of the book. The, there are a number of reasons we can get into them during the course of the hour. The big overarching one, kind of the thread holding the book together and the argument for uh, investors that they can think about is uh, the 40-year decline in interest rates. I refer to them as risk rates, not just interest rates, because there are a lot of factors pressing interest rates. You have to just check the front page of the of the Investors Chronicle, and you'll see that there are a lot of f- factors affecting uh, Bank of England rates, uh, Fed rates, overnight rates, short-term rates, and even longer-term uh, rates, the 10-year rate on the uh, Guild or, or the U.S. Treasury that, that are most important for equity investors. So there are a lot of puts and takes there. But interest rates and risk rates were coming down for 40 years. And that had profound impact. Unless you're in your late 60s in the US as an active investor, you don't really remember what it was like when business ownership through the stock market entailed an income stream. And that ever declining risk rate encouraged businesses to make fewer and fewer payouts. Uh, Fixed income instruments, the, the the cash rate of return decline that goes without saying, but equity as well. And you saw the uh, the the yield of the U.S. stock market's been below two percent since the mid 1990s. It's really been falling even for a decade before that. 
been below 2% and really closer to 1.5% for many years. And you had this, this very low period of uh, cash rates of return and, and perceived risk rates last 15 years since the financial crisis when the government was maintaining very, very low perceived risk rates. So there, there are other reasons which we can get to, the buybacks and the NASDAQ and uh, the geopolitics. But uh, the thread running through the book is what happens when interest rates go down for 40 years? And then more importantly for investors right now, looking at their portfolios and looking to the future, what happens when that stops? When I'm not necessarily forecasting a rise in interest rates, but when interest rates stop going down, when risk rates stop going down, mm -hmm. what happens in the market, in individual portfolios, in company behavior? I think as a historian, it's worth investors, whether they're uh, individual investors, institutional investors, to consider that we've had one paradigm for the last 40 years. I believe it's on its way out. You're going to want to think as a, an investor what that means for your portfolio. Uh, what struck me about the, the book, Dan, it, it's not just that you're you're not just making a corporate governance based argument here. Obviously, we've mentioned one of the non corporate governance arguments underpinning your your thesis, that being rates. But you also talk a, a lot about uh, deglobalization and what that might mean either for dividend strategies or, or the broader in, investors' outlook. How how does that fit into your your thesis is that a product of the interest rate story you're also telling? Yeah, so there's inside baseball, I should say, inside cricket uh, <laughs> here in, in the UK. The interest rates, the buybacks in Nasdaq, are the inside baseball explanations. They occurred. They pushed dividends to the side. They have. Uh, we'll get into how they are no longer as relevant as they were. The kind of tired excuses, and now that's going to, I think, lead to the return of the cash nexus. But there also is this contextual background reason, which isn't really inside baseball at all. It's the global uh, neoliberalism that we've, I'm going to use the word carefully, enjoyed, maybe that's not the best choice mm. of word, that existed it's and was dominant, hegemonic uh, from 1980 or so on. And there, the, the timing of that period, the start of that period is striking. Margaret Thatcher, 1979, Dong Xiaoping, 1979, Ronald Reagan, 1980, interest rates peaking in the United States for the 10-year 1981, buyback laws changing in the United States, and SEC, uh, IRS and SEC change in 1982 uh, that led to the kind of flood of buybacks, and then the march of global neoliberalism, the, the period of Milton Friedman replacing the period of Keynes, that is a period of deregulation and globalization versus a period of, of uh, uh, more government involvement and more regulation. So that really led to a system that in which capital had free reign. Thomas Piketty has been very critical of that, a, a French academic. And now a lot of policy people are critical of it because, frankly, it led to the deindustrialization of much of the Western economies. We outsourced everything to Asia, specifically to China, and then imported those goods back and deflation with them. It worked as it were for as long as it worked. And then starting really in the last few years, that geopolitical framework has not just dissipated, not just receded. It's blown up. It's occurring dramatically in, in front of us. It's one of the chapters in the book. It's getting a, a fair amount of play, but trying not to get too political. But if you just look at in 2020, uh, start with COVID in China, uh, makes the supply chain argument harder. And people are now thinking about having to reinvest corporate executives and governments, reinvest in national industrial policy, in supply chain, in not having just the thinnest, tightest supply chain that maximizes profits, efficiency, but a supply chain, even for service companies, that is more uh, efficacious, shifting a little bit from efficiency to efficacy, meaning more redundancy, meaning more uh, working capital, meaning more costs so that the system is a little bit more robust because obviously the global supply chain failed uh, quite dramatically as a result of, of COVID and what was going on in China. The the second thing is, you know, the politics are, are pretty ugly right now, particularly in the United States. The sense that there is a consensus around global neoliberalism is, is gone, completely gone. Even worse, I would say there's a there's not even a consensus that we need to have a consensus anymore. Instead of trying to reach some sort of agreement, uh, political entities in the United States are, are content to literally say, I, I don't care what the other side thinks, and I'm not interested in reaching a consensus. You would interest rates bottom in September of 2020. And then any lasting idea of neoliberalism and kind of the, the liberal ideal and, and giving a 
um, opportunity to markets and individuals to succeed and having governments agree on that. If there was any lingering doubt, Russia got rid of it by invading Ukraine in 2022, uh, bringing it home, as it were, to Europe. So what's going on politically in the United States and here in Europe, the, the changes in the supply chain and the interest rate structure, this period from 1980 to 2020, boy, is it over. Mm. And so that's part of the paradigm shift. It's not really – the finance part, which is about the interest rates and buybacks and, and NASDAQ, which is addressed in greater length in the book and the implications of those trends reversing. But the broader geopolitical context is very uh, important, that environmental uh, thing. That is what contributed to the maintenance of this environment from 1980 to 2020 and is also going to be ushering in a to-be-determined environment now that the global neoliberal paradigm is is rapidly retreating. Okay. You, you make the argument that a re-embrace of dividends, you know, in, in the way it's attached to this, this paradigm shift or, or, or otherwise, would involve a multi-decade mean reversion in, in investor preferences. I'm just going to play devil's advocate here. One might argue that, yes, asset prices and valuations revert, but some elements of investing and finance don't revert. So take broker's fees, for example. They've gone down. They're probably not going to head back up. Or another big phenomenon of the last few decades, the intangible asset intensity of corporate balance sheets. That's a huge change, which has been a shift from mid-century. Why should something as ephemeral, I suppose, as corporate dividend policies snap back to a, a long-term trend? It's not the same. It's not the same thing as as a price, is it? It's more an attitude, almost a cultural signifier. Why does that mean revert? I'm going to respectfully disagree. Okay. <laughs> so I do agree that certain trends in the industry are, are more long lasting. So the reduction of fees is obvious. You, you, you didn't discuss passive investing and index investing. That's another yep. long term trend that's not likely to change any anytime soon. The trend will likely continue. However, I, I argue in the book, and I would appeal to anyone who runs a business that the notion that business ownership, and it's a big theme that runs through this book in a prior one from 2018, that the notion of business ownership without some sort of income stream is historically anomalous. A uh, show of hands of everyone out there in the audience that owns rental real estate or farmland or any other business and never, ever expects hmm. to take a income distribution from said business. If you plan to run the business, I'm looking at you into the camera. I realize <laughs> only parts of these are being videoed. But if you've never ever expect to engage in a commercial enterprise and you expect it to be loss making in perpetuity or break even or profitable, but you'll never ever take a cash distribution, that scenario just doesn't exist in the state of nature. It, it, it's just ab abnormal. Mm -hmm. Now, there are turnarounds, there are distressed businesses, and there are poor, pure speculators. Commodities are often a pure speculation business. There's a whole culture of speculation involving alternative currencies. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the people who are engaged in that realize they know at the very uh, moment of entering the relationship that there's no income stream associated with that. What was interesting was when the crypto and others were trying to pay and uh, a dividend yield on um, – mm. there's digital coins paying a dividend yield on something – a non-productive asset. It was very, very interesting. But that is historically anomalous that you have large businesses not making profit distributions to company owners. And I don't think it's a radical statement to make the mean reversion argument there. I have been met in the media, particularly by young people, Alex, who think it's a <laughs> bomb-throwing radical statement to suggest – that a commercial venture would have a cash stream associated with it. I actually think of it as a mean reversion, very kind of conservative, cranky old man argument. As the book came out and I've had discussions in the media, I have been surprised to the extent in which I'm being cast as a bit of a radical. Uh, again, I view it as a very, very conservative argument. Hmm. Time will tell. The history will tell. Uh, if the current environment with all of its uh, puffery, it's a good kind of English word, not really used in American <laughs> English, but with all of its puffery, is the new norm. Guess what? I'm wrong. Mm. Uh, I'm willing to look at the last, oh, I don't know, call it 5,000 years of recorded commercial history. That's a call out to Will Getzman at Yale, who's win, written a, a wonderful history of global history of finance. Last 5,000 years of commercial history versus the last 30 years of U.S. stock market history and say one of these is anomalous and the other is not. And I, I do think the room for – if it's not pure statistical mean reversion, just the pendulum swinging back, 
yeah, I'm going to I'm going to make that claim. I did make that claim. Sure. Look, hey, Dan, our job here is to kick the tires sometimes uh, unfairly, seemingly. Um, I mean, the obvious rejoinder to this, well, it's a two part question here is, well, you know, U.S. equity, U.S. equity returns last time we checked haven't been too bad. OK, measured on a total return basis. Absolutely. Um, the other parallel story here is technology and I wonder if hand in hand here we've seen, well, maybe the Overton window of acceptable cap capital structures has just been widened by technology where scale growth has, you know, transformed by our modern technology has just changed the rules of the game a little bit here. I mean, we're not talking about the income yield from lumber anymore. We're talking about massive businesses which can grow in a, a couple of years to be billion dollar uh, enterprises. Does that change the rules of the game to you? For you? In a uh, scale, yes, type no. It is absolutely true that the, from a relative total return perspective in a cashless calculation system, the non-cash approach has really delivered spectacular total return. But there are anomalies there, unusual attributes to it. In a dividendless, in a cash streamless business, think of some of the the kind of downstream consequences of that. In order to benefit from it, in order to what I would say call fund consumption, you have to sell the asset. What a strange business where you get nothing from it and the only way you can benefit from its success is to part company with it. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not illegal, not unethical, not immoral. And it's worked really, really well the last particular last two decades or so, last 15 years. These businesses have uh, become very, very large, very successful. You can argue whether their uh, market shares are unsustainable, the technology moats are not sustainable, but maybe they are. That's great. But how unusual is it that they are so successful and yet they either cannot or choose not to pay a dividend? That's a very strange definition of success. I'm not challenging their business success. I'm just mm -hmm. saying within the capital structure, that's that's very unusual. Now, investors have not picked up their their picks and axes and 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 Molotov cocktails and gone out protesting on the street because, in stock market terms, it has been very successful. And investors, in order to fund consumption, have happily substituted harvesting capital gains for an income stream, and it's worked very well the last couple of decades. I'm not challenging that. I'm just saying that's unusual. Maybe it lasts. Maybe it doesn't. It does appear to be the pendulum has swung very far to one mm. extreme. Uh, maybe it continues for many, many more decades. I'll be proven wrong. That's that's fine. If I'm proven wrong, by the way, it's probably the case that the stock market and these, these wealth generators have just continue to expand uh, exponentially, in which case a lot of people will be very happy. But I, I, I'm pointing out to you it is an unusual environment. Has the technology fundamentally changed a 5,000-year-old structure that the value of an asset is the net present value of the income stream that you receive from an asset, whether it's a private asset, public asset, real estate, commodity, whatever the case may be? No, I, I, I don't see how the, having an AI chip fundamentally changes kind of the, the rules of of business ownership, it has allowed people to be very happy as what I would refer to as speculators because, again, they are simply dependent – they're dependent simply on the share price. They receive nothing or de minimis income stream. Hmm. They're dependent just on the share price and in order to manifest success, they have to sell it rather than buy it. So that that's I, – I don't uh, – cast, cast no shade on the business success sure. of, of the dominant businesses of today. I'm just saying it's it's unusual and I expect that they too will eventually come around to the cash nexus. We did see one large social media company a few weeks ago go down that path with a symbolic dividend, mm -hmm. not a material one. And at the same time, they announced a dividend that was worth $5 billion. They announced a share buyback worth $50 billion. So that tells you where yeah. the pendulum has not started swinging back yet. But it, it's a it's a notable symbolic shift. Yeah. And I'd like to I'd like to come on to Meta and the examples of a couple of other companies in a bit. The I wonder if feeding into to this around the the I suppose the impetus to to sell shares as a mean of ownership, which is a bit of a paradox, is that and, and this is an area that maybe shareholders and analysts don't talk too much about, which is stock-based compensation. Maybe there's this assumption that keeping executives sweet is a top priority. But I think as you, you point out in the book is that companies that issue dividends do end up with very different incentive structures for company insiders. 
um, and the incentives end up focusing on market prices. Um, and as you say, share ownership isn't encouraged. Share selling is. Is is there been an element of executive capture in our relationship with dividends? Yeah, I think that the the imbalance in relations, particularly more in the U.S. Mm-hmm. power relationship between chief executive and board and shareholders, that being a minority shareholder in the U.S., you really, even though on paper there are corporate governance structures, you get to vote, there are proxies, it's awfully hard. In the U.K. and in Europe, it's not, the imbalance never got quite as large. You have supervisory boards, you have a separation of chairman and chief executive that uh, generally speaking, the chief financial officer in many cases is not on the board, et cetera. So it's uh, somewhat of a different culture. But that makes my point, I would argue, even greater that in an environment in which as a minority shareholder in the U.S. that is a not majority shareholder, you not your, – your votes don't matter that much. It's, there are a bunch of reasons why passive investing, institutional investing, et cetera, et cetera. But a bunch of your, – your votes don't matter as an individual shareholder all that much. In that environment, all the more – you want at least something tangible for your investment stake to hold the shares, and that is um, a, a dividend stream instead of uh, you know restricted op- restricted share option grants or restriction share unit grants to uh, executives and employees. They don't come with a dividend. There's not much reason uh, to fund consumption. You can't. You have to sell them. I do make a point in the book that there is another way. And it's both in the United States and outside the United States. And I I do believe that some of the conflict between capital and labor – and this may be naive. Let's actually – let's call it naive. Naive but still perhaps helpful is that if more employees own more dividend-paying shares and had an incentive to hold the shares, then you would possibly – again, I don't want to be too naive about it – possibly see – a sense between capital and labor that they're rowing in the same direction or trying to row in the same direction. I don't know how well that argument will play in in Europe, but uh, it's actually more evident in Europe because there is more more of the companies pay dividends and there there can be more just plain vanilla share ownership. And I have an example from a, a French company in the book where they make a big announcement about how many dividends have gone to uh, employee owners of the company, employee shareholders, and because of that income stream, the the employees are incented to hold the shares, not sell them. That's total. Is it that is total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you do see in the original employee stock ownership plans in the United States, these are from decades ago, the uh, 1960s and 70s, that the dividend paid a key role in financing a mechanism by which employees could own shares in the business, often from a founder from a private company. So what are called ESOPs are particularly effective in regard to privately held companies, and that's where they tend to dominate. But my, my a suggestion is that, well, for a large dividend paying company, if there was more employee ownership and the employees were incented to keep the shares, then when it comes time for whether it's a union negotiation or just ongoing business affairs, there's a slightly greater chance that that labor and management might, might see eye to eye. So I, I, I do think that it is a mechanism to to address some some power imbalances, uh, a, a mar- modest mechanism, but a mechanism all the same between minority share owners and the business and employees and management uh, by having the return of the cash nexus. Mm. Very conscious. If I'm going to stray into talking about tax efficiency, this might be the point where people pause their podcasts or um, or go find something better to do. But I think it is an, in, an area worth tackling on the subject of buybacks that I also want to explore here. I mean, some companies and investors complain that dividends can complicate things from a tax perspective. Um, Do you think that that either America's tax treatment of dividends needs to change or that there needs to be a a balance struck either between those incentives as as, as they end up um, falling to buybacks um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in relation to dividends. Yeah, the carrot tax structure is fairly benign, meaning it is uh, neutral between uh, buybacks, qualified dividend income, and uh, long-term holdings and the cap- uh, presumed capital gains. Can be a capital loss, but the presumed capital gains from long-term holding. Uh, those tax rates are, were neutralized, uh, were evened in twenty in two thousand and three. So it's been twenty years. So there's no actual tax rate differential from an investment perspective between the two. The, the difference is in timing, that a, a dividend is a timed event, creates a taxable moment, relatively small 
for each individual moment, but but taxable moment each time it happens. Whereas if a company doesn't pay a dividend and you're an investor and you wish to uh, not generate a capital gain that year, but wish to defer to a later time period, you can by simply not owning it. You can also defer the capital loss. Let's say the share price is going down. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to take the capital loss now, you can take it in the market. So again, it, it's presumed to be a capital gain, but it can be a capital loss. But over time, it has been more capital gains. That timing issue is so loud in the marketplace. If you want to make that point, by all means, I, 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 please stop shouting in my ear. I get your point. You don't want to pay the tax man under any circumstances, or you prefer not to. And what's more, you're prepared because dividend paying securities and non-dividend paying securities tend to be different. You are prepared to subordinate investment policy to tax minimization. That is a choice. It's not a necessity. It's a choice that many people make, happily so. I'm just pointing out it's a choice. And there are other people who look to a dividend saying, and even though it's a taxable event, saying, wow, just got a check in the mail, source of a company's profits, they must be doing something right. Yeah, it's a taxable event, but I, I know what it is. It's cash on the barrel. Again, these are choices. They're not necessities. The academics have uh, – there's a whole chapter. There are two chapters in the book, which you, you, you as a reader may glaze over because I, I go into the – the trenches of, of academic warfare uh, in two, two instances, uh, one, the academics against dividends and the other, the academics for dividends. And boy, it's, it's, it is brutal trench warfare. But at the end of the day, the academics writing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s when taxes on dividends in the United States were higher than taxes on capital gain just cannot conceive that anyone would not take that into their calculations. Now their argument is reduced to just one, which is just timing uh, because dividend tax rates are the same. And they, 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 But the loudness of that argument is still so profound. And I, again, fine. Stop shouting in my ear. I, I'm just saying it's a choice to subordinate investment policy to tax minimization. There are lots of investors out there who want to make that choice. I've got no issue with it. To me, however, it, it is not a reason why the cash nexus or standard business ownership logic, which would be attached to an income stream, should, should be avoided. If you're going to literally, I don't know, throw everything away about business ownership just to avoid taxation, that is your choice, but certainly not my choice. Mm. Uh, maybe a lesser plank of the, or I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it's a greater plank of the, the, I suppose the academic take on uh, all of this is the idea that the test of any capital return framework has to be if a you know a dollar or a pound in the company's hands is more valuable than that same uh, dollar or pound in the shareholder's hands. What's your response to the, the, the I suppose this view that a company without the capacity to find a higher return on cash than interest in a, in a in a brokerage just isn't worth owning. That's the I suppose that's the rejoinder some some might make to the idea that to the whole concept of, of yep. dividends. Yeah, very trusting soul. You're probably if you are that person, I think you're probably quite optimistic, very sunny, very cheery, uh, very believing of everyone. <laughs> Sadly, I, I I can't I can't share your unrestrained, unconstricted, unmeasured optimism that the CEO telling you that he, he or she has unlimited growth prospects. I just, uh, sure. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. That's a very, that's good to hear, but I, I, I'm not there. The reality is, as a minority owner of a business, particularly in the US case where corporate governance on paper strong and in practice is quite weak, the dividend does act as a check on perhaps the slight possibility that the CEO's optimism and cockiness is in fact overstated. God forbid such a mm. thing. But it does happen that corporations waste money. Mergers and acquisitions and buybacks would be examples one and two of, in one case, overpaying for things, in the other case, speculating in your shares with company cash. And a dividend is a modest agency cost check. Uh, I don't know if we want to get into the literature of agency costs, but simply a way of checking 
keeping a modest constraint on someone you've given capital to to keep them at least a little bit more thoughtful before they go out and spend every last penny on a shiny new object or on their own share prices, share st- uh, shares. So it, it is a tool that a uh, minority shareholder has that I think is a reasonable compromise. Now, if you are the majority owner of a company and you're sitting there with your hired employee, known as the CEO, then you can have really very good discussions about capital allocation, acquisitions, doing this, doing that, whatever the corporate strategy is. As a minority shareholder, you're not really invited to those meetings. And it turns out, particularly in the US, your view doesn't doesn't matter, even though you do have a proxy vote and, and should exercise that proxy vote. But the pendulum was also swung in terms of corporate power in the U.S. And it, it really is in the hands of the CEOs, who are also often the chairman of the corporations. So I, I view this as a modest, a modest check. There, it is a false charge at a canard against the dividend investor that uh, they're uh, choking off growth. Look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. There's close to a trillion dollars in buybacks. That's not investment in businesses. That's speculation in shares. Companies in the US have plenty of cash to invest in their business and uh, also uh, pay shareholders. uh, And there's plenty of money to come from just the the buybacks without choking off uh, growth. Mm. The... uh, You're going to have to bear with me um, here, Dan. I have this very vague theory that... um, one of the worst things to happen to investors over the, over the last three decades were those, you know, these sort of generic stock images of office places in which there's always some exceptionally handsome mid-ranking executive showing a line chart heading up a 45-degree angle. Do you think there's, you know, with, with investing, you're talking about those investors who, who in their late 60s who might remember, you know, income playing a greater role. But, I mean, for a lot of that, the previous paradigm that we were talking about has involved prices going up and up and then do you think there has been a a psychological need to see prices rising and maybe we can attach that phenomenon to to cryptomania a little bit and 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 maybe that that's why that that's one reason why you know dividends have been excluded or or have have dropped down from the 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 equation that it is that there's actually something in just how we think about Investing, I say, mm-hmm. I say we. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's an, a very ephemeral judgment mm-hmm. I've just made, but yeah. So as as I mentioned earlier, but we can elaborate on because there's, there's a, a chapter in the book about stock prices and charts, literally chart the phenomenon. What when you look at a, a chart of a uh, stock on your on your computer or even in your handheld, there's a lot going on there that you don't really mm. uh, realize. Listen, the the capital gains, harvesting capital gains to fund consumption and looking at capital gains, unrealized capital gains to make you feel better, it's worked really well. The dividend investor or the business owner operating through the stock market is not a bear market investor, doesn't want share prices to go down. Dividend growth drives share price increases. Total return is you know whatever the yield was at the starting point plus the growth in the share price driven by the dividend growth rate itself. Over time, share prices grow in line with the dividend. So we also like charts to the up and to the right. Uh, and as I make a point in the book, you can have the higher total return, more money for you in a flattish chart than you might have in an up and to the right chart if the flattish chart it comes with a higher dividend yield. And the math is very, very you know simple. If you have a, a stock that doesn't pay a dividend that goes up 6% a year, and that's great. And then you have a dividend-paying security that has an 8% total return, but it's a 4% yield and 4% dividend growth reflected in 4% share price growth. That chart's going to look a lot worse, but the total return's been higher. So mm-hmm. the issue is not wealth creation. It, it's that the the focus on the share price is different from wealth creation. and But it's worked well. You are correct. Dividend, non-dividend paying securities, the, the, the darlings have made everyone feel really good. Uh, again, remember the wealth creation is purely psychological until you sell the asset mm-hmm. and then it's become real uh, and hopefully you've sold the asset for you know, as it were, a huge gain. But that psychological reality of, of the dopamine that coming from a rising share price as opposed to a check in the mail, I don't, I don't dispute that. I'm just pointing out, as I do in, in the book about stock charts and more broadly about the argument about business ownership is, you know, know what you're doing there. That is speculation and share prices dependent upon 
other people. Uh, a dividend check is a profit sharing dependent upon the business. And again, a stock chart can be a, a misleading measure of, of wealth creation. Mm. I said we were going to come on to it. One stock, I suppose, if you look at their their chart, it is up and to the right quite considerably. Meta, they announced um, a couple of weeks ago an inaugural dividend, um, the intention to pay one, de minimis, as you as you did point out, but still a dividend nonetheless. And this was this was hailed by some as a moment that the company finally matured, which I thought was quite an interesting description of the business. Which, I mean, we don't have to get too much into the weeds of of you know the the investment case of Meta here, but there are you know there are some you know investors do have some concerns about about that business and its direction, despite it being enormously profitable for shareholders. I mean, just to play devil's advocate here, could could we also interpret a move of of uh, you know dividends being now paid to shareholders that some trust might have broken down, and the investors would actually like their in some cases, would actually like their capital back. Thanks very much. Or should they just be selling if they're taking that attitude? I, I don't want to read too much into in a, a particular security, but sure. I, uh, you know, this I, the book does forecast that other companies are going to be subject to the cash nexus, the return of cash nexus. Cash now has a return, cash return, uh, meaning uh, money market funds, short term securities, government. Securities now have a meaningful cash return. Fixed income securities, private fixed income securities have a meaningful cash return. The stock market in the U.S. still doesn't. I just think the pressure is going to be overwhelming Mm -hmm. from an asset allocation perspective to compete for capital that more and more companies are going to do that. I think to some extent it's it's just that simple, that the competition for cash, what it will tell will be those companies that can do it and those that can't. Mm -hmm. Tides going out to hackneyed Warren Buffett phrase too many times. Who's wearing a bathing suit? Who's not? So those companies, and if you look at the stock market darlings over the last couple decade, uh, couple years, whether Fangs or Magnificent Seven, et cetera, you can distinguish between those that can and those that can't. It's not that hard. The numbers are on, you know, they're publicly available. And some of these companies are profitless growth and some are highly profitable mm-hmm. growth. And I just think the ones that are highly profitable growth will eventually respond to that. It's not a huge judgment about going X growth. I do think, again, the, f- the funding is there. It's mostly going into buybacks mm-hmm. now. It can easily go into to dividends. It's not really going into the reinvestment of the businesses, hence all the buybacks. I do forecast in the book, however, given what's happened to the global supply chain and the geopolitics, that U.S. companies in particular are going to have to spend more to do the same. That there's going to be... I made made up in a meaning. I took half of the uh, operating margin gain of the last 20 years from S&P non-financials. It was 400 basis points and just took half of that and said 200 basis points needs to be reinvested back into businesses to make up for the fact that the pendulum had swung too far in terms of supply chain, in terms of outsourcing, in terms of efficiency over efficacy. And we're going to have 200 basis points of spend towards efficacy at the cost of efficiency. And that's the right thing to do as the pendulum swings back. And we will see which companies can afford that and which which can't. If you have a business that can only exist because of cheap capital and manufacturing in some very, very distant land, we'll see, I think you're going to have a hard time going forward. Yeah. If I may just turn to the UK for a moment. I mean, UK stocks are sometimes criticized for their focus on income. You know, and, and the idea that this leads to perennially short-sighted capital allocation decisions that are focused not on value creation but on rent and a, and a return of a return of capital rather than a return on capital. Where does the balance lie in your in your judgment? Do you, do you see you, the UK and Europe? I know you, I know in your funds you do invest in some UK companies for their dividends. You, so you you have a kind of a unique position that you're see, you're looking at you know, both the US market and Europe with a slightly different attitude to dividends. Where do you, where, where is the happy middle for you? Yeah, it's a little distressing to be here in the UK. <laughs> you folks are all very depressed and you're very <laughs> down on yourself. And I I've met with investors here and business executives and, and a little bit darker than, than in the US. I, I, I will grant you that. I, I don't know if you're being too hard on yourselves, but NASDAQ and the investment boom there and the innovation that came there, that's real. Can't, can't dismiss that. And kind of the U.S. got that and the rest of the world, less so. And that's just a fact. I don't have an answer for that. I think there are lots of 
I don't know, experts on innovation and company executives themselves who could give you a better explanation of why that happened, where it did. And, but that, you know, that's, it is what it is. Those companies have been very successful and continue to be successful. I'm just arguing they're mature. Why they didn't materialize here uh, as much and, and focused uh, in Silicon Valley uh, and, and NASDAQ, I, I, I don't have a great explanation for that. I, I wouldn't be too hard on yourselves, though. I mean, you know, uh, yes, the U.S. has benefited from the NASDAQ phenomenon. And uh, but every day is a new day, and uh, I, I'm I'm uh, not too concerned. I'm not quite as depressed about the whole situation as many of the people I meet in the UK. It doesn't seem that hopeless. Yeah, well, I, th- I think I would I would tend to agree with you. Um, that we can, we we can beat ourselves up a little bit. One interesting, maybe a sort of contra meta example I've I've sort of noticed looking at the stock recently is. Shell. Now, Shell for UK investors, probably one of the most, if not the most important dividend stock over decades and decades. It cut its it pay out in the, uh, it, during the pandemic when oil prices briefly went negative. And, but it's been on a bit, uh, has been on a bit of a tear uh, since then. The result, though, of that, you know, that very painful pandemic experience is that the stock went on a, a bit of a round trip from £25 to less than £10. And now it's, you know, back around the 25 uh, pound level. That said, their capital allocation framework seems to be tilting towards the buyback. Whereas I would, I would think if they, you know, I, I, I suppose they're playing to different audiences here, aren't they? They've got in a, a big international investor base, which might have sort of opinions on the on the on the tax treatment of, of dividends. There might be withholding tax issues there, and also the com- you know the company tends to, to trade at, uh, uh, you know, below 10 times PE, it will obviously make the case that its stock is deeply undervalued. I, I mean, what's interesting for me is that from a retail investor perspective, this has been in some ways a horrible stock to own if you're going to apply a total return strategy over the last few years. You're having to make huge scything cuts to your, your capital at points of crisis, potentially when you need the cash the most, because the dividend's just been cut. Have they? Uh, do Do you think, in a way, that their capital? There's a clear. Well, I don't want to ask too misleading a question here, but the retail investor almost experience here is that dividends are more consistent and and, and friendlier capital framework than than the one that it seems some institutional investors are calling out for. Is that fair characterization without, you know, we don't have to focus on shell? The, the, the reputation is that it's more consistent, but there is one element missing and it's a very simple one. And it's the original, original notion of diversification, not the diversification that you, you think about now. Uh, the original diversification that Harry Markowitz and Modern Portfolio Theory represented was going from, you know, one or two securities from owning one uh, prominent energy company in the UK to, in his classic work from 1959, you might want to consider owning nine plus cash because mm. then the, the benefits of diversification kick in because an individual company's results, income streams, share prices is going to be volatile. You know, further work, it's not very complicated statistical or academic work shows the benefits of 20, 30 or 40 holdings. You're going you're gonna to cover your bases for, and get that consistency of the income stream. That's not what you're currently your financial advisor currently or the academic or the third parties currently encourage you to do they want you to own thousands of securities through ETFs and passive vehicles that have way too many securities you basically own the market now owning the market might be a really good solution but don't call it diversification diversification is to kind of maximize return minimize volatility with 30 or 40 you're there Three or four thousand, you're not there. You stop. You went someplace else. You went to just owning the the market. So, I think that from a retail investor perspective, from an investor chronicle perspective, basic common sense diversification addresses the fact that certain companies are highly volatile from a business perspective. Energy is a you know great example. Other companies can get it. There are other UK dividend champions which have gotten themselves in trouble, and uh, you know they they are uh, dividend investor. Uh, in a stock market, it takes dividend risk in order to generate dividend return. Sometimes that dividend risk doesn't work out. You own 30 or 40 or 50, you've taken care of that. So I, I being a business investor in the stock market is to acknowledge that certain companies are more cyclical than others. There are there have been changes in the energy sector. The energy sector gets uh, uh, unusual changes, externalities, uh, COVID, et cetera. 
fracking in the United States has upended the industry. Then COVID, you have, uh, and then you have issues more political and, and climate related, climate change related and regulatory related. So there's a lot going on there. So you do want to make sure that you have basic diversification. If you want to own 5,000 securities and never think about being a business owner and, and you're exposed completely to the market and have essentially not diversification, you are exposed to the market, whether it goes up or down. But if you are interested in managing and generating a stable income stream, then uh, you would want to you know, uh, take the basic steps towards diversification. And that does allow you access to companies in the energy space that, that may have more cyclical business models. Mm. Just, just finally, Dan, I want to ask, I mean, you, you manage portfolios of, of dividend-focused stocks. Lots of our listeners and, and, and readers will be managing their own income based portfolios. In your judgment, should it require less day-to-day -day management focusing on dividends? Should it, sh should it also be uh, an investing strategy which, by function of not having to focus so much on price, you should actually be able to you know, make more of your time to, to do all the other wonderful things in life that don't involve investing. Yeah, I, that's one of the, the advantages, I think, of being a dividend investor in a stock market. And I don't want to use a statistical term, but I will, but variances. If you think about business outcomes, dividend outcomes, and share price outcomes, a the most responsibly run businesses, and even if they're not responsibly run, if you have 30 or 40 of them, you have a responsibly run portfolio of them. The variances, that is the degree to which the, the dividend moves around is relatively small. The degree to which share prices move around is relatively large and er even earnings. And so you can make a choice in your life. You can engage in something that has huge variances. That involves a lot of attention and energy and kind of uh, a strong stomach. Or you can choose something that has lower variances and involves the ability maybe you know, to manage that a little bit more easily, uh, to have someone else manage it, in, in my case, me as it were, the, you know, and, and you know, a third party dividend manager. But the variances in the dividend world are just lower mm -hmm. than the variances in the stock price world. And that will appeal to some people. Also, the stock price world will appeal to other people, uh, people who go to the to the betting part. I forget what those oh, – it's called off, off track, off track, OTB in the UK. What are they called when you go to – Well, the dog, the, the dog races. Yeah, well, you can bet on anything. But in any case, the UK has a, a big betting culture on pretty much anything, mm. right? And so if you enjoy that, then great. You get mm. to enjoy that. Or better yet, if you choose a low variance – approach that might leave time and money to go to the dog track yep. because you know that that's not really where your funding consumption from is not from your winnings at the dog track. So it's, it's I think it's a psychological issue uh, that certain people wired for more excitement and other people wired for less excitement. Being a dividend owner in a stock market is an interesting – it's a high volatility platform, but there is a path to a low variance approach to that to that platform. Mm. The bookies, I just think, just bookies, just, yeah, just, bookies. It just occurred to me blatantly. Yeah. Dan, that's that's about all uh, the time we have. So I want to say thanks so much for your time today. I really enjoyed our chat, and uh, good luck, good luck again with the book. I don't know if that's on the video there, but again, the ownership dividend out now via Routledge. Thanks so much to my producer Maddie Upthorpe as well, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me.